Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the course Decoding Comic Studies and Reading Graphic Narratives in 21st Century India. So uh, in the last lecture we were talking about the contribution made by Gronenstein and we discussed his wonderful book Comics and Narration. There are uh, certain things that I wanted to you to know more on it. So let's say for example in the last lecture I was talking about reciter and mostrator, right. So see these are the just terms and I am sure that you will just remember it and you will become familiar in due course of time. What is a reciter? See when we are reading a comic book, right, when we are reading a comic book, what happens? there is something written material on it. So when we know about the character, when we know about the theme and the story, it is a job of a reciter which means reciter only focuses on writing materials. Whereas when it comes to mostrator, what does mostrator do? He looks at, right, he looks at the visual material or let's say for example audio visual material available on the page and through that if he tries to know about the character or what kind of a character is what character thinks and how the story is moving that is the job of a mostrator right so here the idea of bringing reciter and mostrator is just to make you understand that how are we going to grapple with the character or with the theme or the story or the technique or the narrative style all right so i just thought that what if this idea is not clear to you and that is why i explained you uh, a bit more right second thing else let's say for example if i have to ask you in one line what is the contribution of a granistein right just to one line not more than uh, it's not a passage or a book just uh, one line, you will say that Gronestein focuses more on the space, right, a space from one panel to the other, either you call it gutter or whatever, he is more concerned about what happens in the space and that is what the huge contribution that is like one of the important contribution made by Gronestein and that is why personally I feel that Gronestein is unique like Will Asner and MacLeod, all right. So, let us say for example, the another important thing that he has also talked in his book Comics and Narration is uh, how to know about a character, right, through the visual, audio visual, through the audio visual method, right. It is a simple that when you want to know the emotional turbulent of a character and he is speaking something then there is a jagged line on the speech bubbles, right. So it seems you could sense that he is screaming, he is shouting, so it does not require anything written on it, you know, it does not require anything written on it. It is, we do not need any writing materials to know that, to know about the character's emotional turbulence. It is only clear, it becomes quite evident. If we try to see and we see the jag line and if he is shouting, so we see that he is screaming because of his emotional problems or emotional turbulent, alright. So these are the like wonderful uh, contribution uh, made by uh, uh, Gronestein and obviously in the last lecture we like in the few of the lectures we saw him in details and we discuss all his uh, important uh, component of the book that how it contributes in comic studies, alright. So, in today's lecture, what I am going to focus on, you may say comic versus art or you may say Bart Beatty, it is almost the same. Why? 
because Bart Beatty has written a book called Comic Versus Art and as the title itself suggests that comic versus art means that there are two things different have been brought together to see we are going to compare, we are going to do contrast. So, let us say for example, if I have to ask you write an essay on comic versus art or do you think comic is an art or you think that uh, comic can become a part of an art, right? You just do not have to do anything. You just go through Bart Beatty's this book called Comic versus Art and what I am going to speak for one hour today, you will understand completely. There is a, another reason that why I am talking about Bart Beatty all as a comic versus art today in lecture number 12, right? The one prominent reason is like Bill Asner, like McCloud, like Granstein, we have a person called Bart Beatty who has made a remarkable impact in comic culture, right? So, therefore, one important thing is this. What is the another important thing and significant for us is when we look at the title comic versus art. So, as we have seen since very beginning, it has been already a debatable point that are we going to read comics as a kind of other form of art or it is in a part of art or it is just in a particular object which we are not supposed to take seriously, right? So, today in the lecture, we are going to look at all the important facets and I will try to explain to you as much as possible, all right? So, before we go into the directly into the theme, let us first try to know who is Bart Beatty. Obviously, I have already mentioned about that person, right? Bart Beatty, you are not first time listening in this course, you have already heard the name Bart Beatty before this, but today we are going to take him in details and see what he has to say to us or to the comic culture or to the world of art, alright? So, going to the slides please, look at the slide. As you see, the title is Comic versus Art, lecture number 12 and here we have the person Bart Beatty, right? First, we would like to know who is Bart Beatty, right? He is a professor, let me write it for you so that you can understand an important professor of communication and culture. Now you see, I will ask you certain things and that is why I am writing it deliberately and he was at the University of Calgary, right? If you see, Bart Beatty as itself suggests professor of communication and culture, which means he has something to do with communication and culture. So, now we can understand that comic culture is also part of a communication, right? So, which means comic is a medium through which we communicate in a culture or we talk about a culture or we produce a culture or we consume a culture that is how we do through the comic medium and which is why being a professor of a communication and culture, but BT could understand that there is something very much related with comics and communication. So far, comics have never been taken seriously as a uh, uh, important facets through which it can uh, contribute to us, right? So, Bart Beatty as a professor of communication and culture, he emphasizes on that how comic study, let us say comics can also contribute something in producing or consumption of a culture, right? Second thing is that is very important that you will see he has extensively written on comics and popular culture, right? One thing becomes very clear that how are we going to look at comics as it is a part of a, a popular culture or as it is a part of a ancient culture. 
right see when i'm saying ancient culture i don't refer to that ancient things what i'm saying that how are we going to place comics where we are going to position comics right that is an important question all right so he has written extensively on comics and popular culture and his work has been published in numerous journal and books bt wrote a book length intellectual biography of dr frederick wertham right a psychiatrist who is best known for his anti comics crusade against comic books bt is also a comics scholar and has written about the history and cultural significance of american books comic american books he co translated jean paul gabliet's of comics and men a cultural history of american comic books that came out in 2009 let me uh, write it for you in case uh, uh, you want to recall it of comics and men that came out in 2009 so and that came out in english which we have already known about while talking about the history of western comics right and that is why i said that it is not the first time we are talking about bart bt bt has written reviews of books on various topics including textual criticism and realism he has also written editorials on issues related to comics studies such as the concept of a canon in the field bt has conducted interviews with other scholars such as kate story silvia marino about their work in biological research overall bart bt is a respected scholar in the fields of communication culture and after his interest in comic culture he is also known as a wonderful scholar in comic studies right now when we are going to look at the slides further the one thing that you have to keep in the mind that he has also debated on the concept of a canon right that is a question before i move ahead it's my job to explain to you a bit that what is a canon right we all have understood so far are familiar with and we know that there are a lot of books which we know let's say for which we read in our ug days or in pg days let me bring some examples from the uh, literature let's say for example when i say that you are pursuing ug course from some respectable universities what are you reading obviously you have name shakespeare milton uh, oscar wilde so on and wordsworth shelley so on and so forth all right the question is how and why shelley keats or let's say wordsworth and shakespeare are prescribed in your course and you are reading it why is it not so that you are reading there are other kind of writers who are available but you don't read them in fact they are from the british itself suppose if you say because it's english literature so we are supposed to read books from english writings however you are very familiar with that nowadays lot of other books even written in other regional languages are part of english department but let's not go into the de debate on english studies or how uh, english studies emerged how it transformed itself that is not the question that i am raising the question i am raising is there is a canon there are certain set of works available for us which we read right which we read for sure across universities they are prescribed for us and that is what they say is a canon now there is a huge politics behind what what kind of writing takes the shape of a canon right i'll talk about it but <clears throat> just keep this in mind as i said okay, when i teach my job is also to question something which as a student of either comic studies or let's say uh, graphic narratives or let's say english literature or whatever you are reading your job is to think contemplate and ponder upon so when we are talking about comic studies the question is that 
how are we going to define the canon? Let's say, let's think for a second, right? Think for a second that we are going to open a course on comic studies, right? Let's say, for example, we are going to open a com course on comic studies in particular university, so and so, whatever university you name. Now, the job would be what are we going to teach, right? The purpose of establishing a department is to inculcate a particular form of a knowledge and also to develop a particular field. Now the question is when we are going to prescribe certain materials, what nature of the material would be? What are the points that we are going to take into the consideration before we ask you to read X, Y, Z, alright? And that is how there will be set up five or six people who will sit and they will all debate and discuss on the points and that is how there is a formation of a canon, right? That is how canon is formed. So, there is a possibility that they may look at certain comic which they think is more about morality, is more about religion, it is more about uh, ancient culture of a particular con country or community and that is why students should read this. And the moment someone says this, obviously you know that there will be a different kind of a canon, right? Suppose someone says, no, 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 let us uh, uh, introduce a kind of a comics which are uh, new in technique and experience with itself, right? And then obviously the previous decision will not fit with the second one, right? The later one will not go with the former one and here we see that former and the later will become different. So, what I am saying that that becomes a very moot point where people are sitting together and they are going to finalize about what kind of a book you are going to study and that is why Bart Beat is important because in comic studies he also debated on the issues of a canon. As you could see itself that the title is comic versus art which means that I mean look at the title like why comic versus art does that mean comic is not an art? It presupposes that comic is not an art. So, then we have to ask what is the nature of an art? What is the function of an art and how I and how this comic is not going to be the function in the nature of an art, right? and there becomes an interesting point of a debate. So, think for a second that why is it so that Bart Beatty decided to name his book comic versus art and second thing and why is it so that the people excluded comic to accept as a form of an art, right? So, these are the questions which are we going to unravel and we will see the nuances, but remember one thing that either it is a canon or whatever we are going to read is all nothing but a part of a simple politics, all right. So, moving ahead now, <coughs> going back to the slides. Now, you see that Bart Beatty's comic versus art is a book, right, that analyzes the relationship between comics and art in the 20th and 21st century. This book so, title is simple, but it serves as a critical framework for BT's interrogation of the specific <coughs> historical social process that have led to the marginalization of a comics within the art world. BT's methodology is interdisciplinary, drawing on the theories from art history, cultural studies, literary criticism. To explore the complex relationship between comics and the art world, the book examines the relationship between comics and the most important institution of the art world, including museums, auction houses and galleries. Beatty argues that the art world has historically marginalized com comics and that this marginalization has been reinforced by the institutional structure of the art world. He also explores the ways in which comics have been appropriated 
by the art world and the implication of this appropriation for the comics medium. BT emphasizes that he is not setting out to say that comics are finally a legitimate art form, nor to bemoan the soddy treatment of a comics by the art world. Instead, he seeks to explore the complex relationship between comics and art and to understand the ways in which this relationship has been shaped by historical and social processes. Overall, comics versus art is a thought-provoking and interdisciplinary analysis of the relationship between comics and art. The book is a valuable resource for anyone interested in the history and theory of a comics as well as for scholars of art history, culture studies and literary criticism. BT's methodology is decidedly original, skewing literary or fan-centered accounts of both art and comics community in favor of a sociology of the arts that surrounds comics and art culture more broadly. Because of this, the chapter in comic versus art take a wide breadth of a topic in addressing comics and art proper. Twice, Wizard Magazine, Royal Echelstein, Clement Greenberg, even Frederick Nietzsche take their place in analysis besides the curated art shows, auctions and comics anthologies that populate the comic art assemblers. Let us then explore BT's work specifically highlighting the economic and nostalgic threats that he brings to light over the course of comic versus art. So before I explore more in detail, let me make a one important significant point. Remember my dear friends that any art cannot be understood completely if we isolate it from the location or the culture in which it is situated, right? Therefore, as I have been emphasizing this point since the very beginning, that the change in the culture and social processes determines that what kind of a medium will be considered appropriate and legitimate to communicate with us and what kind of a medium or let's say uh, method will be illegitimate and inappropriate to communicate with us. All right. So let's say for example, let me again elucidate this point if you have not listened to me carefully in the beginning. Let's say for example that at the advent of the internet, now you see that people are listening to you even on the Twitter, on the Facebook, on the Instagram or other, face, other online channels. Now initially if you go somewhere and you speak, they are going to be bothered that who that person is, that legitimacy they will look for and the authority that you have to speak for or on certain issues. But today, even if you are not a professor of a history, even if you don't have a legitimate like ground to speak for history, but if you write something on your social media accounts, people are going to fight for it, people are going to debate on it. They will not think that, okay, this person does not come from a history, history background, or like a discipline he does not belong to. He may not have a good information so that is why he is speaking so let us uh, ignore him let us not take him or her seriously but because the changes in the social and political processes and the society in which we are living in we all have our like we all have got right to speak our mind whatever through any particular medium that we choose right and so see, I am not here suggesting that you should not speak. No, that is not the point I am making. Like a Bart BT, Bart BT is not supporting that either comics is an art or comics is not an art, right? And that is why I love Bart BT for the particular reason that he is taking a position just to debate. He is not saying comic is wonderful art and we are supposed to take seriously. What he does, he talks about the relationship between comics and art. He is in fact bringing the challenges that comics and art faces when they are coming together. Moreover, 
in fact comics and art he is trying to explore the tension between comics and art right so he is not taking any side that okay comic is a wonderful great art and we are supposed to take it seriously or art why they denounce it so that is why i said it at the very beginning it is not that he is bemoaning that art artist or let's say the comic was never considered to be a part of an art so he is he is lamenting over it or he is shouting on it no what is saying that he just concerned about the tension between comic and art the release like tension between the relationship of comics and art in the same way I am also not saying that you should speak something or you should not speak something. I am just saying that now you see because of the social and cultural process have taken a new shape. It has changed. It has been, it is not what it was before. Now things have become very different. All right. That is the only point I am making like a Bart BT. All right. So let us go to the slide please. Now you see here. So when we are looking at uh, uh, BT's book comic versus art bad beauty is comic versus art opens with reading of a painting containing a comic panel that painting is lucy mackenzie's untitled like 2004 uh, a large portrait of a woman at a table with a framed photographic comic panel from milo mangara Sil Goshio hanging over her head. The, I am not deliberately showing you the pic, however I have it but for the reason that it has a, some sexual explicit uh, comment or as a picture. So, right? so I am just going to read it again for you and I am expecting that you will visualize what kind of and, and later on you can search. Right? So, that is the only reason that why I am not showing you the pic. Right? The particular reason is that it has a sexual explicit photos and certain comments all right so the book opens with a reading of a painting containing a comic panel the painting is lucy mackenzie's untitled large portrait of a woman at a table with a framed pornographic comic panel from milo manara siligoshio hanging over her head beat explains mackenzie's work through the tension that it embodies the high art of the painting itself is asserted through the semi ironic appropriation of the explicitly pornographic low art comic panel. The painting itself is shorthand for the critical question that comic versus art seeks to answer. Why are comics not treated as art? Right? See, the point is <coughs> why comic is not treated as serious as other arts are treated, right? As I said that it deliberately opens with that kind of uh, image. In fact, it is like a comics where he is bringing two things together. One as a high art and another let us say for example considered to be the low art. Right? And I am sure that I do not want to discuss it in detail but I am sure that you will think about it that why is it so that it, if something has to do with nudity or sexuality it always degraded it was never taken seriously it was always thought as if it is a low art so what happens that bringing two form of art together one low art another high art so where there is a one uh, uh, like there is a lady who goes to a restaurant and sophisticated lady obviously she is sitting on the table and having a something a cup of tea or whatever and then and the same restaurant there is a photo of a, uh, a, a pornographic uh, photo almost right and they both are brought together deliberately by Bart BT just to show that how like to show that how you are going to now think about the distinction the line between high and low art all right so Keep this in mind and then think about the question that Bart BT is raising. All right. So, going back to the slide, here you see why are comics not treated as art? Right. Why are the legend of a comics art rarely considered to be artist by the art world on the whole? 
there is a, not a simple global answer to the question. Instead, there are paths, paths to be the followed and a specific relation to analyze in order to understand the order of the things in relationship between the art and the comics world. BT explicitly states that he is concerned with the specific hierarchies that create certain cultural value judgment about work like untitled. It is in this analysis that we find the reality of the material object to be a key motivator and commanding force in the art comics debate. All right, so see before I move, I just want to make one thing uh, clear to you and whenever you are reading Bart BT, remember that one side in your mind you have to keep art word and another side you have to keep in your mind comic word. All right. And what we are going, what we are doing, in fact, is exploring the tension between two different words, right? Art word is another word and comic word is another word. Why is it so that art word is not ready to accept comic word, right? These are the questions that we are exploring in comic versus art by Bart Beatty, all right? So, moving to the next slides that you see that a central concern in the high art criticism of a comics is that they are perishable object. The argument holds that comic have a certain lifespan after which they are extinguished. They hold no value to humans after their, well, after their use value is expended. Listen to this carefully, right? And at the same time, keep looking at the slides because that will help you to understand the point that I am making. Their content is taken in as knowledge by the user and their lives are over. This is contrasted with the high art which is constantly rewarding to the viewer, listener or reader. It returns to life when a viewer comes into contact with it. That is to say, that high art objects are in a sense immortal where the pop object mass produced and disposable lives a life that is nasty, short and brutish. The intervention of a pop art during the 1960s shattered this division between high and low art. As BT writes, pop art itself constituted a threat to the established hierarchies of the arts. Taking it one step further, pop art's existence dismissed the notion that art was necessarily the product of a unique object in the world. Art was no longer the immortal object, but instead it was everywhere on soda cans, in the grocery store and the draw larger than life on billboards. Pop art revealed art as a multitude and wounded the art apparatus irrevocably. The project of high art after pop art is one of the applying balm. Beat's analysis of the comic referencing art of Roy Lichtenstein is wholly concerned with this wound and the way the art world patched it over by accepting Lichtenstein into the canon of the 20th century artist, prefiguring the collection and processing of artists like Robert Crumb and Chris Ware in the decades to come. All right. So, see, the point is quite simple that during the 1960s, right, during the 1960s what happened that when the pop art started coming into the picture, it started dis dismantling the hierarchy between lower art and high art. Right. So, so far before 1960s at least there was a clear distinction people could make that okay this is considered to be the high art and this is considered to be the low art. But when the pop art started emerging right after the 1960s and Bart Beatty has put still like very much emphasis on that what does a pop art 
do to the hierarchy of uh, low and high art all right so i'm sure that like you are very familiar uh, with this kind of a discourse and you understand all right so moving to the next slides now you see that comics that sociological project that bt embarks on is not merely concerned with the human element of the comic arts assemblage that artist put it also takes into the account of the wound object themselves physical comic books and related paraphernalia two chapters are devoted two chapters are devoted to the material and commodities qualities of a comic books and their related offspring which most often take the form of a toys and fan magazines it is in this chapter that the economics of both world is most clearly laid out for the reader the comic book is necessarily a mass produced item and bt highlights the process like grading right grading that have allowed for comics to enter into economic arena of fine art so this thread of economic uh, moves through the entire uh, work and is highlighted when bt discusses the concept of pedigree collection right here it is in regard to comic book auctions pedigree collections are rare collections of extremely well preserved comic books which have avoided yellowing with age reading damage or any other quality that removes them from absolutely mint condition these comics then determine the value of the other similar comics in the comic book economy by determining the highest value of a comic book the mid range and down is also defined the valuing of a comic holds a fun house mirror up to the economics of a fine art in the latter case a work of art is valued because of a critical praise and its uniqueness in the world a sculpture or a photograph print is limited in order to generate a certain value for that work comic books only come to this status through age and consumption by the marketplace in this case consumption is quite literal the market chews the work up gets it dirty crushes it under bus seats until it no longer contains value only the pedigree books that survive or avoid of being public have an existence as commodities all right so see one thing uh, that uh, uh, crosses my mind which i would like to tell you that sometime it is a market economy that determines the quality of a work of art right so let's say for example that if you write something and if it is being sold like anything and people are buying it people are purchasing it people are consuming it so people are going to take your work of art seriously and people are going to read it like anything all right and obviously economy becomes one of the important aspect as the publishing house are emerging every day in our market you could see that they only are going to sell those kind of a books which they think are going to be read by the uh, by the people right and i'm sure that if you are not aware i'll let you know that if you write something and a publisher think that if i publish it it has just knowledge value it has no economic value which means i won't be able to earn money if i if i print it and if i publish it and if i uh, use invest if i invest my money in publishing this book and i am not going to get anything in back because people are not going to read it even if it has a huge knowledge value right so the point what i am making is sometime the idea of a classic or the canon is also depend on the particular politics that decides that who is going to read what or in what numbers people are going to read right so keep uh, uh, 
दीज कंसिडरेशन इन योर बैक ऑफ माइंड सो दैट यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड वट बाट बी टी इज ऑल्सो हिंटिंग टूअर्ड्स और राइट सो दिस इज एन आइडिया विच आई वॉन्ट यू टू कीप इन योर माइंड सो लव लेट मी सो यू द स्लाइड एंड प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड दिस सो हियर यू सी दैट इन कंट्रास्ट टू द गैलरी आर्ट पीस विच हैज वैल्यू बेस्ड ऑन इट्स लिमिटेड एग्जिस्टेंस इन द वर्ल्ड फ्रॉम द स्टार्ट द कॉमिक बुक ओनली गेन्स वैल्यू वेन इट इज किल्ड ऑफ इशू बाई इशू हाउ एवर द इंडिविजुअल लाइफ ऑफ अ कॉमिक बुक इशूज कैन नेवर अकाउंट फॉर द डिजायर फॉर दो कॉमिक्स इन द फ्यूचर इफ एज द क्रिटिक ऑफ अ कॉमिक्स रिमाइंड अस कॉमिक्स आर एक्सपेंडेबल then why are they so highly sought after by collectors for bt it is nostalgia right keep this word in mind it is nostalgia the endless spinning for a past that cannot be recreated that drives the economy of a comic books this discussion of nostalgia however must be tempered with an understanding of why nostalgia is so addicting a critical part of nostalgia is the creation of a relationship that was possible in a specific time and place and which is no longer possible today when a comic fan in her 40s states that reading a comic or seeing an advertisement takes her back what she is really saying is that the object interpolates her in a particular way she adopts a new subjectivity in the face of the comic book object so from the account that bt presents in comic versus art there is a little for the art word to do in the face of this nostalgic desire other than adapt this adaptation is exemplified in the adoption of a two comic artist in the canon of a 20th century artist robert crumb and chris ware all right so see uh, i mean uh, one thing that let me more uh, um, clear uh, clearly make it for you that why is it relating comics with nostalgia let me give you my personal example all right in my childhood days i have been saying this that i used to read obviously hindi uh, comic book let's say uh, 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 dhruv or uh, nagraj or chacha choudhary and sabu right and i tell you the truth that even today if those comics are given to me and if i get them i am going to read with the same interest as i used to read in my childhood days what does it talk about right what does it mean to us when i say that i still go in nostalgia and feel the pleasure of reading those uh, comic book it talks about my subjectivity it talks about that when i look at certain comics book of label in the market how it is interpolating me my subjectivity my subjectivity is modified in way that i desire of reading that book right this i i as a vivek is constantly being uh, constantly being uh, 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 re, uh, reformed on the basis that what kind of a book i feel to read like what i'm feeling to read so this this, this nostalgia what is saying that for the comic right this nostalgia what he is saying that for the comic it is nothing but the nostalgia of the reader carries forward the long value of a comic book right all is a durability all is a longevity of a book is determined by the nostalgic feeling of a uh, of a uh, of a person who desire whenever he sees some book and he feels that how he used to read those books in the backyard all right so moving ahead now uh, see the uh, now uh, slide now you see that what i was trying to in, like make you interest that 
how the past which is being created again right the past is being created just by that nostalgic feeling right so which means that the important is like look at this nostalgia right this discussion of nostalgia must be tempered with an understanding of why nostalgia is so addicting that is the question i am asking you right why nostalgia is so addicting a critical part of nostalgia is the reason is that the creation of a relationship that was possible in a specific time and place and which is no longer possible today right so this is a very much a kind of a conceptual understanding of uh, what does nostalgia do to the subjectivity of a human being and it also relates us that how we look at ourselves or what we are and how do we desire or like how we adopt a new subjectivity in the face of comics book object all right so uh, now moving ahead in a, uh, in a number of ways these creators are in complete opposition to one another crumbs ragged dirty lines and cheap 1970s style logos contrast sharply with wears clean lines and early 20th century design aesthetic however both artists a play into the mythology that high art has set of itself in the contemporary period both artists are in a sense tortured by their subjective experience in the world they allow their own lives passions and fears to spill out onto the page thin layers of fiction coat the biographies that form the basis for most of their comics work the critical component to the adoption of wear and crumb right wear and crumb is that they both allow for dish overall of commodity form of art right while comics as objects can never be lose their mass produced commodity status a particular stance of an artist allows for a selective forgetting to occur on a part of an art community according to bt robert crumb and weir they had established themselves as an autonomous artist completely unconcerned with the art market it is no coincidence that the stale sale of a golden age comic books was vastly overshadowed by the sale of an original r crumb cover illustration at a record setting auction in the 1996 the cover the, like the over the top portion of a crumb combined with his unapologetic autobiographical comics that highlight his flaws including brutal sexism and racism allows him to easily be absorbed into the masculine standard practice that of the art world bt's analysis of roy lichtenstein's paintings are appropriate here the inclusion of a comics into art threatened to feminize the realm of artist production by associating the art world with the feminine practices of mass consumption crumb's work thus embodies an overcoding of a comic itself as highly subjective masculine behavior constitutes his work as a particularly masculine product masking the feminine commodity property that the comic book inherently carries all right so see with this example what uh, robert crumb and weir what bd is trying to talk about he is trying to say the politics of producing a work of art nothing else in one line right his he is equating the work of art as a masculine production or feminine production and he is also exposing that how it is economy market that drives that what kind of art will be sold into the market right so keep this in your mind when we are going to read the 
next slide all right so moving to the next slide here we have the another person called krish ware right just now we saw uh, uh, robert crumb now we have krish ware right so krish ware operates in a slightly different register his movement into being accepted as an artist in his own right is also based on the art community ability to disavow right but instead of operating as a mask of economic function where is a way of dealing with the fetish of nostalgia bt writes that wears visual aesthetic which is highly influenced by outmoded styles seems deeply nostalgic for an era in which he never lived wears art operate in much the same way as contemporary comic collecting operates and will operate in the next 25 to 50 years in the foreseeable future the hot commodity that is the first appearance of spider man will be fetishized by people who are not alive for the event it is already occurring now where's art situated in a gallery space becomes a way of distancing the viewer from the affective power of nostalgia by wearing a desire for the past as a badge the contemporary world is able to mask its adoption of a fundamentally backward facing format where's art takes on an ironic character is there anything that the curator can do when viewing wares work other than laugh at how profoundly sad it is to be living in this moment in time these artists are but two of many that uh, uh, have made art making or will make the transition between obscurity in the comics ghetto and fame in the galleries across the planet all right so what does bt suggest here right bt suggest that this process of allowing certain artist into art world under certain condition has been crucial to how the art world has managed to preserve old hierarchy while using a more celebratory language in keeping with its own version of post modernism this inclusion of a comic art is a way of patching the wound that mass media has made in the body of the art world as a whole bart bt gives us a smart sociological understanding of the comics art assemblers in comic versus art but he also gives us something more the book contains a toolbox for understanding relation between human and the material reality of art object he imparts on the reader a healthy distrust in the way that any artist can neatly occupy the space allotted to her or him he forces us to integrate not only why in question of a dominance but also how by explaining in detail the order and arrangement of events and bodies all right so what we notice so far that what bart bt is doing in his uh, book is this that he is not just concerned about why art world dominated why is it so that the work of art was always excluded right but he is more concerned about how did it happen right what is the process through which a particular form of art was never taken seriously by the art world which is a basically a comic medium right so the point is that as a professor of a communication and culture bart bt interestingly focuses on certain points to explain to us that how certain factors are involved in which or by which this comic medium was never became a serious part of the society so these are the 
interesting remarkable point that was made by uh, uh, Bart Beatty. So, which when, like whenever we are reading this comic versus art, right? So you recall that even uh, D. H. Lawrence, a very uh, famous book, Lady Chatterley's Lover, right? What happens? What is a what is the treatment of the uh, what is the treatment of the uh, people with this book? You you remember that I had already told you that this book was banned. People did not read it. D. H. Lawrence was being read on the street. Right? People did not take him seriously. He was never part of a classic, what we call quote unquote, right? But later point of time, today when people understood that society changed, the culture started changing itself, then we saw that there is a huge uh, respect for D. H. Lawrence's work. Lady Chatterley's lover, Sun Science lovers, became one of the important component of English literature and we are reading him in details. Alright, so CCU, what I am just talking about that the politics. Alright, so going back to the slide again that you see that, so, so what I try to do with this lecture is to, I was like possibly, we was, I was able to set light on the major comics theories that have established the range of comic medium beyond the definitional aspect that we discussed earlier. One of the major, um, major aim of talking about uh, Bart Beatty, Granstein and in fact the theory was to inform you about the most important theoretical text and name associated with comic studies. With a note, that more advanced theories will also be dealt right in due course of time. So, uh, uh, so uh, for now, I'll uh, stop here, right? And uh, I would say that please read Bart Beatty uh, before we uh, talk uh, about graphic novels in the next lecture. All right. So, thank you. See you again. Take care. Bye-bye.